This is SSN. Story Studio Network. I'm Tom Hoppy, and I'm your host of the most painful podcast. This is our second last episode of season two, and I'd like to thank you, the listening audience, for your support of the show. So please feel free to continue to send in your suggestions on topics and what you want to hear. You can reach us at Facebook and Twitter, Chronic Pain COE, and on Instagram at Chronic Pain underscore COE. In episode seven, we had Dr. Abby Manusud explaining how yogatic breathing can help calm the nervous system, which can help with chronic pain. He also provided some breath work practice on the show. So if you're interested in that, please listen to that. So I'm sure many of you have read and heard a lot of information on how food fuels our bodies to help us get through the day. But can food help with chronic pain? To talk to me about this today, I'm joined by Monica Schlieg, a nutritionist and registered dietitian with Hamilton Health Science and used to work at the uh, DeGroote Pain Clinic in Hamilton. Monica, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. So I guess to start the show, um, maybe we can just talk about the importance of nutrition and and how it can help the body and then go from there. Yeah, so just like you mentioned, Tom, I think a lot of us know about the importance of food being fuel for our bodies, not just for our physical energy needs, but our mental energy needs. But sometimes we think about um, different aspects of it and how it might affect negatively or positively in more detailed kind of situations. And certainly when it comes to chronic pain, there's various elements we look at of how not only what we eat, but also how we eat and why we eat can affect our overall health, physical, mental, emotional. So I think a lot of us probably know that, you know, the quality of food that we eat matters, but a big part of also what I would talk to patients about is making sure we get adequate variety in their diets, not only to get the different kind of nutrients we know can be helpful for, you know, restoring muscle function and improving our mood, but also to make sure that we're feeding the different bacteria found in our our gastrointestinal tract, which if you're familiar with the gut microbiome, that's a big focus of when we talk about chronic pain, because we know oftentimes when there's chronic pain, there is some element of inflammation going in the body. And the more research we have now about the gut microbiome and everything that's living in our intestinal tracts, the more we know that a lot of inflammation is rooted in there, not to mention a lot of our, uh, you know, risk for chronic diseases. Yeah, I've heard that, you know, people call the, uh, the gut almost like the second brain, in a sense. You got it. And that's, yeah. So that, that's the, uh, I guess, where it's important. I mean, we've heard things like, I guess, sauerkraut and stuff like that, right? Is that the prebiotics that people are talking about that helps with that gut micro? Yeah, that's a good point. So definitely um, when we talk about improving the gut microbiome and making sure we have not just a lot of the good bacteria that might help with, you know, managing how we feel, but also making sure there's an, an adequate variety. And that's where what I initially talked about comes into play because every kind of bacteria has different kind of benefits in our health. So we want to make sure we're flourishing all those different types. So certainly several ways we talk about it is making sure we get a good balance of probiotics, prebiotics, and those can be foods that are fermented, like your sauerkraut, kefir, kimchi, kombucha, uh, tempeh, as well as foods that are high in fiber because we know the bacteria in our guts actually digest it and use it as fuel at turning it into beneficial substances. So maybe you can just give us like a a quick you know, down and dirty on what's the difference between a prebiotic and a probiotic. And then maybe talk a little bit about some of the food that help each of those groups. Sure. That's a great question. It's a common one too. There's only one letter difference. So probiotics are what we think of as we are introducing bacteria that we want to be living in our gut microbiomes. And we're just introducing new strains or more of them, helping them flourish. So it's kind of a live bacteria that are going to confer some benefit to us. Now, prebiotics with E, they are foods that help to feed the bacteria that are already there. So you can imagine you kind of want to make sure there's a balance of both so that we're not only introducing new strains, but we're helping keep them grow and alive and be healthy. So the probiotics that we were talking about, the live bacteria are going to be those fermented foods that I mentioned, right? So again, the sauerkraut, Tom, that you mentioned, kefir, yogurt, and these are foods that, you know, if you've ever been prescribed, let's say, antibiotics, maybe you've been advised to increase their intake just to help restore some of the bacteria that may have been kind of killed off. Mm -hmm. And now again, of course, the prebiotics are going to be your high fiber foods that turn to beneficial compounds for the bacteria that are already there. And some of those foods might be things like banana, oats, artichokes, garlic, leek, and onion, some of those fiber foods. 
And again, we have to remember fiber is only found in plant foods. So it's not found in meat or dairy or eggs. And that's where a lot of the evidence comes from for saying, you know, let's try to make sure we're increasing our intake of plant-based foods, partly because of all the fiber that's found in them that our healthy gut bacteria can feed on. And I guess that's where we hear a lot of, um, I mean, some of the research I read, you know, about fatty liver disease and, and sugars. And those are the things that the gut, I guess, doesn't use well sugars and processed foods is what I'm trying to say. Yeah, that's a good point. So yeah, not just does making sure we get enough of the healthy food help with, you know, keeping our gut microbiome balanced and healthy and adequate and flourishing and varied, but we have to be conscious of what we're also adding that might negatively affect. We know that some of the biggest um, triggers for inflammation in the body, which we again talked about being the root of many chronic diseases, including pain, is the added sugar we know that cause is a big source of inflammation, especially when it comes to added sugars. So when we talk about sugar guidelines, we don't really worry about the sugar found naturally in fruits or their foods like that, because in those solid foods, the sugar is bound to other things, other nutrients, fiber. It's, you know, it's kind of what we call intrinsic sugar. So when we break it down, it doesn't turn to blood sugar very, very quickly as fast and it gives our body a chance to deal with it better. And we don't have that spike and crash in our sugar levels. However, when we talk about added sugar, where we're adding sugar to the outside of a food, where it's not bound naturally to the inside of the food, what we call extrinsic sugar, that's where we know it can increase inflammation quite a bit. Partly because when we have a lot of added sugar being added to our diets, that does turn to blood sugar very quickly. So it spikes up our blood sugar, and as a result, our body can't keep up with it, it might make us feel a little bit different, and then we see a blood sugar crash. And our bodies don't like that those various fluctuations in blood sugars, blood fats, and that can create some inflammation as well. Not to mention, sorry, our physical, how we physically might feel and mentally, right, the crashing and burning. Yeah, so I mean, we talk about... Uh you know, sugars and, and how the body processes that and it causes inflammation. What are some other foods that can, like, impact chronic pain when uh, make it worse? So not just added sugar, but we know when foods are very, very ultra processed. And I mean, we have to make the, the differentiation between, you know, foods that are just processed, you know, let's say tomatoes into tomato sauce. That's not really too much, you know, we don't want to get caught up in that kind of processing. We're talking about ultra processed foods where they've stripped a lot of the nutrients, all that fiber is gone, right? You're thinking of your whole grain versus your refined white bread, or they've added lots of things like preservatives, additives, coloring maybe to make it taste better, fat, sugar, salt to make it sit on the shelf longer. And those kind of foods, not only are the additives problematic, right? Some of these, our bodies don't really know how to respond to them because they're relatively new in the food supply. But also, a lot of the nutrients that have been stripped, the food doesn't really resemble food in our brains, right? So not only do, does it not really know maybe how to deal with it, digest it, absorb it, but a lot of research shows that the more ultra-processed these foods become, so meaning the less like natural food they resemble, the less our brains feel satisfied by them because they don't really feel that satiation. Those hormones that tell us you're full, you've had a nice balanced meal, you know, with enough fat, enough fiber, protein, they don't get triggered. So we actually have to eat more of them, ironically. So not only are they probably not the healthiest foods to begin with, but we have to eat more to feel satisfied. And that's these highly palatable foods have that kind of vicious cycle effect partly because the blood sugar spikes and crashes as well that I mentioned. So we don't want to demonize all foods, of course. There's no such thing as, you know, unless you have a, a, a certified allergy or some sensitivity that you have to avoid a certain food. You might not have to. We know that's the overall pattern that matters more. But there's a big aspect of why we eat and how quickly we eat and how we feel satisfied. So that's why I tell people, you know, if you allow yourself to have certain treats that sit well with you that you're able to tolerate, chew slowly Give yourself time to enjoy it. Don't do it in front of the TV mindlessly because you're actually able to enjoy it, like I said. And if you're slowing down and eating more, uh, sorry, eating more slowly, digestion actually begins in the mouth. So the more you're able to chew and let your teeth and your saliva start breaking down the food, the less work on your poor gut, which we actually know can be oftentimes negatively influenced when we're living with chronic pain or, you know, any kind of really condition with any kind of anxiety or any kind of organic gut issues. So you're saying like uh, fast eaters, and I, I'm a victim of that, and I think many military people are because you only have a few seconds to wolf something down. 
is not really healthy for the body then in a sense. It's true. Not only is it going to give us more time to realize when we're physically full, if we take the time to slow down, but like I said, it might help with digestion and any kind of upset, you know, side effects of digestion, but you might actually mentally feel like you've enjoyed it more and you actually paid attention, right, to the actual food that you wanted to enjoy. So that's why I think a lot of the habits that we get with of course, one thing is if you're a quick eater because of work or routine, that that's one thing. But if we can try to break, you know, the associations of eating in front of the TV, a lot of us turn to mindless robots and we eat much quicker, we eat more and we eat differently. So I always challenge people, you know, if you want to have an evening snack or if that's something that's normal for you or you need it to keep, you know, keep yourself full, maybe go at commercial break or pause the movie or the TV show or turn it off. Or have a designated eating area and just actually you can still have those foods but you might realize that you need less and you'll enjoy them more if you're able to do them in you know a more mindful way i think the old kind of cliche you know it takes 20 minutes for our brain to feel satisfied and to realize that your stomach's full it holds more true than we think so it does take a little time for those signals to come. And I guess that ties into what you're saying before about gut health is if we're eating the right foods, a lot of fiber and, and that, it, that signals the brain as well that we're, we're full. So if we're eating empty carbs, yes, like you're saying, the processed foods, then we stay hungry and, and we that's a good point. Eat more, may eat something that's not healthy for us at the end of the day. Or... You got it. So you could, it's almost to the point where you could eat as much as you want of, you know, if there's no balance, you'll eat, you can eat as much as you want, but you might not feel satisfied versus if you ate something that has enough of those healthy fats in there that actually fight inflammation, protein, which we know our muscles require and our brain requires and our whole body um, requires regularly in the day, not just once in the day. And making sure there's some fiber, which also keeps us full. Those three components are going to make sure that we have more satiety, which we call. So after meals, we feel satisfied for longer. So I always try to help people try to find ways of getting some healthy fats every time they eat, getting some protein, and ideally some fiber at the same time. Because those slow down digestion. That means that the food sits longer in your stomach, keeping you full for longer. And it makes sure that your blood sugars are going up again in a more stable way. Versus spiking, like you're saying, going up and down a spike. And when we're looking at, I mean, uh, from what I understand with the chronic pain and some of the guests we've had on, I mean, muscle strength and muscle building is is one of the components. And if we have people that are probably in their 50s or 60s, I mean, muscle muscle mass is lost. How's the balance between trying to gain muscle back through diet and also trying to avoid the whole cholesterol and issue as well when you're at that age? Mm -hmm. That's a great point. So if we're talking about inflammation or heart health, of course, you want to make sure we're getting enough protein regularly in the day. So we don't want to be following the kind of classic uh, pattern that people fall into where they might not have any protein in the first half of the day or these kind of minimal amounts. And then we come home uh, and we're used to having a large balanced meal with enough protein. We know our muscles, unfortunately, don't work in that way. They're not that efficient grabbing, you know, all that protein if it's just once per day. We know we want to make sure we're spreading it out evenly so our muscles can actually efficiently use it up. Of course, when we're talking about decreasing inflammation, improving heart health, we want to make sure that all of our protein is not always coming predominantly from animal products doesn't mean you have to go vegetarian or vegan. That's not what we're trying to say here. We're just trying to say is more often than not, if you can try to make, you know, things like legumes, nuts, seeds, a more regular part of your protein sources, that goes a long way, not just for your heart health, inflammation, gut health as well. It increases in fiber, decreases your saturated fat intake. So in general, we try to say, you know, limiting red meat if we can. But if that's not something that people are willing to do, the most important thing I always talk about and I make sure they, they um, understand is we really, really, really want to make sure we're limiting all, like those processed meat products, those cured meats, deli meats, cold cuts, sausages, bacon, that combination that's found in those foods, whether it be the high temperature they're cured at or the fat content or the preservatives or the salt or everything together, we don't know what, causes inflammation so much that you may have heard that these foods were put on the same list as cigarettes in terms of their likelihood to cause cancer just because of how they act in the gut and actually specifically for colorectal cancer risk. So for that reason, I always tell people try to limit those foods as much as possible. Going to leaner options for meat, again, we say legumes, beans, lentils, chickpeas, nuts, seeds more often. If people are comfortable with soybeans, tofu, tempeh as well. And then probably leaner meats like you're talking about chicken or turkey. 
Yes. And if you're able to take off the skin off the poultry, then even better. Lots of good information on that. But now I always find a struggle. And I think some of the other people I've spoken to is, okay, there's so much information out there. How do we, you know, kind of put it in bite size packages that people can can actually grab onto? And you talked about, uh, you know, nuts and vegetables and, and chicken and that. But if someone's struggling with chronic pain or, or they're going through a pain center trying to deal with pain, what are some suggested food groups? I mean, you talked about some of them, but is there anything else you could add to it that makes it more, I guess, manageable for people to understand? In terms of making sure it's available at home or you feel like maybe some tidbits of information, how to make it easy? I think more tidbits of information, like what, you know, if I'm going to go to the grocery store now and say, okay, I, I know the processed foods, so I'm going to stay out of that aisle and we're not going to buy the chocolate and all that kind of thing. But I, we understand the fruits and vegetables are, are important as well. And, and you've talked about some curfew and, and about yogurt and that. Okay, so I have all this, you know, what, how do I int- integrate that into my day? Like, mm-hmm. what am I, should I be eating? Got it. Oatmeal in the morning, should I have eggs and uh, how many eggs should I have a week? I mean, I know that's hard. It's going to be individualized, but in general, if, just some Coles notes for some of the listeners who say, okay, how do I start? What should I have it? And uh, what should I eat? That's a great point. And you, you mentioned that it's individualized. It highly is individualized. So I, I wouldn't want to make blanket statements in terms of, you know, what to specifically eat for each person for various reasons. But when it comes to easy things, I mean, a couple of things I always tell people, especially if you're living with pain or low energy, um, maybe low mood certain times, even buying frozen fruits and vegetables, not only is a convenient thing, But to be honest, a lot of research shows they might actually be higher in nutrition. So not only is it something that, you know, might be cost effective because it's not going bad, you can use it over a prolonged period of time. Because of our limited growing climate in Canada, especially, a lot of our produce is grown, you know, outside of Canada and brought in. Oftentimes in the off season, when we have this fresh produce, it's been picked before ripening, before they're actually ready, before the flavors and nutrients have a chance to develop and they're flown and we think they're fresh versus when they're... When we buy these products frozen, they've been picked at peak harvest. All the nutrients have been had a chance to develop and they've been kind of locked in, frozen in. So then we have the best of both worlds. So that's something I always tell people, keep those on hand. So if you feel like you want to include those foods in your oatmeal, in a smoothie, if you want to roast them, then you have them. You don't have to do too much prepping as well if you have you know limitations with your mobility or pain. So that's one thing I always recommend. Keeping canned or dried legumes, chickpeas, lentils is also a good option. Now, if you're someone who might not have the luxury of planning ahead, I know tomorrow I'm going to make this kind of stew or something, buy the canned options because there's nothing wrong with canned chickpeas, canned beans. The only thing I tell people is rinse them really, really well because A, any kind of canned vegetables are going to have salt usually added and that's usually found on the outside. So if we're rinsing them really well under cold running water, you'll get rid of the sodium which we know can you know, increase blood pressure, increase water retention, that will help with that. And what we know with legumes, oftentimes it might create some gas and bloating. So that will alleviate some of that if you wash off the bubbles. I often tell people, if you can make sure, unless you're following some kind of um, different kind of eating pattern, but if you are eating regularly in the day, I would recommend making sure you eat enough in the first half of the day, because oftentimes we neglect that. And what happens then our blood sugars get awry and our hunger is building all day because we are usually more awake, more alert in the first half of the day. We might be more active, even if you're not moving around a lot, our hormones are higher. Our energy needs are still there. If we're not meeting up, meeting those energy needs with food, our hunger will build up and then we have to eat a lot at once. It's 5, 6, 7 p.m. and we tend to eat more, faster, more convenient foods. And it's not to say we can't eat at night. We just, it doesn't really necessarily make sense to be eating, you know, 60% of our calories after, you know, after the second half of the day when our body's trying to wind down for sleep. And that's when our body temperature drops and we don't want digestion to kind of mess that up. So I think making sure that throughout the day, if you do have things like a handful of unsalted nuts with some fruit, or if you're having yogurt, yeah, with some frozen berries, making sure you're eating something every three or four hours that has some carbohydrates and some protein is a good way to look at it. That will keep everything stable and it might help prevent if there's a risk of overeating at once, it might help prevent that because you're meeting your energy needs throughout the day. And so what I hear you saying is if we're sticking to the whole foods in a sense and and eating throughout the day, so a handful of nuts, I guess, uh, then that lessens the uh, chances of us eating the processed foods, which then will help us with inflammation and then continue. Of course, if we improve our gut health as well in 
that sense. That's a good summary. Yeah, exactly. And then not only does it uh, affect how we feel mentally, physically throughout the day by keeping your energy levels stable, but it also helps alleviate how much we eat at once, which is also overwhelming for our body if we overeat at once. Yeah. And I've also heard that uh, you shouldn't eat three hours before going to bed or going to sleep. So I don't know if there's necessary cutoff. Our metabolism still does work. So there's no necessary black and white kind of thing. However, it's especially important for people who may experience a GERD or acid reflux. If they're having trouble sleeping or digestive issues, you might want to see what appropriate cutoff that is for you because that might you know, worsen some of those symptoms. Okay, perfect. Well, th I think this has been excellent. I've learned a lot out of this. I mean, uh, nutrition and diet is something I've always, I, I've been interested in as well. And, and um, you know, we've had some listeners who, who obviously are interested in this. Like you said, there's so much information out there, but what's the correct information? And so you've been very helpful today and appreciate you being on the show. Thank you, Monica. Thanks for having me. And you're right. There's so much misinformation. So if we can at least, you know, try to simplify some of it and make it less overwhelming, then happy we could do that. Yeah, that's awesome. And and for our listeners, if you have any feedback about the show or any questions uh, on the information you received today, you can contact us at uh, chronicpain.ca uh, or you can follow us on Facebook and Twitter at chronicpaincoe and on Instagram at chronicpain underscore coe. So our next show, which is our last show, is season two. And then uh, because of the support we have from all listeners, we're going to be starting season three uh, in the fall of 2023. Our next show is going to be with uh, Luc Hubert, who is the uh, going to be the French host for our podcast that's uh, going to be starting in Quebec. And uh, we're going to be talking to him. So uh, thanks, everybody, for listening. Uh, thanks again, Monica. And uh, stay healthy and stay keep the hope alive. The Most Painful Podcast is produced for the Chronic Pain Center of Excellence by Story Studio Network and Eye Contact Productions.